Hi, welcome to chapter two. This uh, mass comm affects how society and uh, media interact. I think you can see this as the theory chapter. Every chapter of Ralph Hansen's book has a case study. And some of the case studies I'm just happy to have you read. Other case studies uh, I think are worthy of, of talking about. And this case study is about the Me Too movement. And, you know, one of the remarkable things about the, the Me Too movement is that, you know, I, I'm going to just assume that men, especially powerful men, have harassed women since the beginning of time. And that fact has been known for nearly all of that time. But somehow it took until 2017 for prominent men, uh, including Harvey Weinstein and, and Bill Cosby, to really be called to account uh, because of their behavior. And it wasn't just these two gentlemen, although they are extreme cases. And what I'd like to know, and what I'd really invite you to light up the chat box with, is why do you think that the news media began to pay more attention to sexual harassment in 2017? You know, I assume it was around in 2012 and 2007 and 1987. I mean, why 2017? What, what had fallen into place that suddenly it kind of had to be covered? And furthermore, in this coverage of the Me Too movement, which really came full flower in 2017, do you see the news media as leading the charge? Or do you see them kind of following? Do you see them as kind of reacting? I'd, I'd, I'd like to read your thoughts. Let's talk about... Uh, a little bit of the, uh, the, the, the back story of mass communication in American society. In the early years of the United States, it is fair to say that most people lived in small towns or rural areas, and those areas were generally quite homogeneous. In other words, people tended to live with people from a similar ethnic, racial, and religious background. Beginning, perhaps, in the 1830s in the large cities of uh, America's Northeast, the Industrial Revolution began to draw people into the cities from the countryside. Uh, these were oftentimes laborers who were coming in to work in factories that were beginning to mass-produce goods. And while I, I, I can't say that... Uh, northeastern cities uh, uh, in the years leading up to the Civil War were, were somehow diverse like we would understand diversity today. Uh, it, it is also uh, fair to say that as people got drawn out of their little towns into larger cities that they did begin to interact with people who were more diverse than, than before. So media begins to have a little greater influence. Certainly church, family, and community still have considerable sway over how people think about things. But as people begin to get in more impersonal atmospheres, media, newspapers and magazines, and books, uh, begin to have a little more importance. Let's talk about the direct effects model. And what's kind of strange about the direct effects model is it gets presented both in your textbook and in this lecture uh, as something to be knocked down. And I think the reason why, why Ralph Hansen presents the direct effects model only to knock it down is that it is the way that I think most people assume that media messages work. So how people are motivated 
you know, the, the psychological aspect of how people are motivated really began to be looked at with the First World War. Uh, World War I was not a terribly popular war in the United States. Uh, isolationist sentiment was, was pretty strong. And the older theory uh, was the direct effects model, that if you give people certain images, certain ideas, uh, you will sway pretty much everybody in your direction. I mean, some may be persuaded a little more, others may be persuaded a little less, but there are predictable incremental changes in viewpoint uh, based upon what message you, uh, you put out. So the direct effects model, uh, among other things, uh, would have said, gee, if Michael Bloomberg, uh, when he was running for president, you know, had functionally limitless resources uh, to have billboards and radio ads and TV ads and online ads and so on and so forth, that therefore uh, Michael Bloomberg should win the Democratic nomination and the general election. Well, as we know, that didn't happen. Uh, the newer theory is the indirect effects model. And the indirect effects model says essentially media messages are a little like footballs in that they can take some funny bounces. And what I mean by that is the indirect effects model says you can send the same message to different people and they will interpret it in different ways. So, you know, why would they do that? Well, because individuals are interpreting messages through the filter of their background, through the filter of their needs and their values. I mean, as I discuss this while uh, still under safer at home orders uh, due to the coronavirus uh, crisis, you know, the indirect effects model would look at something like the messages saying, you know, stay at home, you know, don't make uh, unnecessary trips, uh, you know, certain businesses have to be closed till further notice. The indirect effects model is based upon your own individual background needs and values. That message is going to hit you differently than maybe it would hit your neighbor. Now, the, uh, the limited effects model, or the indirect effects model, begins to be developed uh, uh, right around the World War II era. Paul Leserfeld was a pioneering uh, sociologist at Princeton. And Leserfeld and his research assistants uh, made a, a study of how did people decide whether to vote for President Roosevelt for a third term or for his Republican challenger, Wendell Wilkie, in the 1940 presidential election? Well, if the direct effects model had really been explanatory, then President Roosevelt should have won in every state. Uh, he had far higher name recognition. He had uh, a, a more pervasive campaign. Uh, he was in the news every day. And President Roosevelt did win. Uh, however, he did not win every state. He did not win every vote. And so Lazarfeld and, and his uh, uh, researchers tried to figure out, well, you know, how did people figure out who to vote for. And more than a mass media campaign, it was opinion leaders, maybe a co-worker who had some ideas about Roosevelt's economic plans, or maybe it was a neighbor, or maybe it was your Uncle Fred, I don't know. Uh, but these opinion leaders were particularly influential. As for media content, and the campaign itself, it had an indirect effect. So Wendell Wilkie's uh, campaign appearances uh, 
probably energized some, but not all, who were exposed to them. It was the interpersonal influence which was stronger. You know, among other things, this probably speaks well for the notion of internet influencers. You know, those folks who make their living by suggesting that, you know, certain products are, are pretty cool. And then they wrap it in videos uh, showing their own purportedly uh, glamorous lifestyle. You know, perhaps uh, an influencer who you follow on YouTube could be an opinion leader. You know, I haven't really seen research on that, but it seems like it would fit in. Paul Lazarfeld and his research team uh, found out some things about that 1940 election that we still follow uh, today in terms of political campaigns. One thing that he found that is certainly a truth is that the voters with the strongest opinions tune into a campaign early and they are unlikely to change their opinions. So let's get back to Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred is a strong advocate of Second Amendment uh, rights, and he would not be swayed by uh, you know, unlimited uh, campaign messages about gun control. His, his views are his views. And the same with Aunt Edna, who is a, a, a strong uh, uh, gun control uh, proponent. Furthermore, the sort of voter who uh, tunes into a campaign in its earliest stages are oftentimes the people with the strongest views. And in other words, the people who have already made up their minds. And so you'd say, well, you know, if, if, um, if these folks who are tuning in in the early stages of a campaign have already made up their minds, why are they tuning in? Well... Perhaps it is to root for their side. Perhaps it is to look for evidence to confirm their already pre-existing point of view. Seasoned politicians know that the closer that you get to an election, the more important uh, uh, campaigning is. Typically, it is what is called the swing voter who decides elections. I mean, you know, think about the 2016 presidential election, which I think we all still, you know, think about. How Mr. Trump won, by a pretty narrow margin, some states that normally go for Democrats. Places like uh, Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And probably... It was those swing voters, those folks who weren't tuned into the campaign in its early stages, who saw something from Mr. Trump that they liked or something from Hillary Clinton that they disliked, that shifted maybe three or five percent of the voters from one side to the other, and that decided those states, and that decided the election. Let's get to the critical cultural model. This is another theory of how people uh, use media messages. In the critical cultural model, uh, the focus is not how a media message affects your behavior. The focus is on how people use that message to interpret what's happening around them. So what people do is people aren't powerless under the critical cultural model. They take those messages and they construct them into meaning, into a worldview, essentially. Now you'd say, gee, does this mean that all the power is, is on the side of the individual and uh, big media is just, you know, they, they, they just can't control anything? Well, no, no. 
big media still, you know, plays the tune, right? They, they still control the creation, the flow of information. Uh, as I uh, uh, record this chapter, I look through my morning newspaper, and yes, I still get it on print, and it is hard to find a story that doesn't have something to do with coronavirus. So big media may not be very good at telling you this is exactly what you should be doing and this is exactly what you should not be doing. You know, not everyone is going to follow. But if big media is continuing to cover coronavirus at the, uh, at the exclusion of nearly every other topic, well, then that in itself is going to set the information agenda. Now, the critical cultural model, uh, you, you, you can't help but wonder, does it work as well in the Internet age? I mean, think about media of, say, 30 years ago. You had a few television networks. You had a local newspaper. You had some influential magazines. But, you know, other than that, for daily news, it was really coming through a relatively few sources. So does the critical cultural model work as well in the Internet age? And I guess, you know, in considering your comments, and I hope you do weigh in on the chat box on this, uh, Think about how the internet could perhaps help people create meaning from media messages and how they might be doing that through the internet. But at the same time, does the internet help big media control the creation and flow of information? Or does the internet somehow undermine that? I'd like to see your thoughts. Types of media effects. Message effects are pretty obvious. Uh, newspaper editors will debate over what verb to use in a headline. You know, what, what will say the news without overstating it, without shading it toward one position or another. You know, those uh, news outlets that really take their neutrality seriously, you know, they, they, they will really kind of parse that. Also in the world of print media, uh, sometimes news organizations will uh, look at how many times one side in a story is quoted versus how many times uh, another side is, is quoted in a story. Medium effects. You know, different mass media are good at doing different things. Uh, for example, if we have a very detailed, complex sort of story, uh, it is, for example, legislation going through Congress to help bail out small business owners who are in financial trouble because of the coronavirus uh, crisis. And there's a lot of details, there's a lot of qualifications, there's you know, there, there's just a lot to it. Well, that's the kind of story that plays out very well in a major newspaper or perhaps in a, a text uh, online format. On the other hand, if you have uh, an earthquake that has uh, occurred somewhere and there are ongoing efforts to rescue people from homes and office buildings. Uh, that sort of live, very pictorial drama plays out, you know, extremely well on television. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a story some time back about a young woman who, whose car had... Uh, uh, the engine had gone dead on a, on a railroad track. And as fate would have it, a train was coming. And she got hit by the freight train, and it dragged along her car by its bumper. And all the young woman could think of doing was getting out her cell phone 
and calling 911. And of course, those 911 calls are, are recorded. So the young woman is screaming into her phone about how she's being dragged along by a train and all this stuff. And you hear all this horrible screeching and banging of metal in the background. Wow, was that ever a dramatic radio story? So yeah, different mass media can do different things well. Ownership effects. Um, who owns a media outlet can certainly have an impact on how it does its business. The Los Angeles Times has been given new life uh, uh, over the last uh, couple of years after it was purchased by a local biotech billionaire, Dr. Patrick Shushiong. I will talk more about him when we get to the newspaper chapter. One thing that his ownership has done is that he has been able to invest in the paper. Uh, it has been hiring top-level reporting talent for the first time in years. Uh, another uh, expression of ownership effects with Dr. Shushion is he is a medical doctor by training and in particular he's a biotech innovator and so he has been doing a series of podcasts on the LA Times website about the science of coronavirus and the effort to fight it. Active audience effects. I think that uh, Active audience, when you talked about mass media, used to be letters to the editor uh, of a newspaper or a magazine. Today, with online media, the commentary about a post can be more wide-ranging and, frankly, more interesting than the original post itself. So that's active audience effects.
the spiral of silence. The key to understanding this theory is that most people, most of the time, want to be part of a majority. They don't want to be the person who has the weird point of view. So under the spiral of silence, if you have uh, a belief that you say, oh, that's, that's going to be outside the mainstream, you're going to be more likely to keep it to yourself. So as a result of that, those minority opinions, and by minority I mean you know, you're not in the majority, uh, they appear to be less prevalent than they really are. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, oh, I, I, I believe Bernie Sanders uh, campaigned on, among other things, that uh, uh, student loan debt should be forgiven. Well, I would imagine that's a darned popular opinion uh, uh, among college students, that you, know, you have that, uh, uh, that student loan bill, whether it be $500 or $20,000, that, yeah, you know, why not be for that, 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 you know, that it would be forgiven, it would come down to zero. Now, let's just say that you are that student who says, you know, no, uh, education should have a cost to it, uh, and, you know, you would have your reasons for it. Under the spiral of silence, you would be less likely to speak up with your point of view in, in the classroom because you know it's not going to be a popular point of view. Now that said, uh, there are some folks who really enjoy having contrary opinions. Uh, you know, you know the type. They they they, they enjoy you know, staking out a, a point of view that others will oppose, and so then they can get into it, and you know, it becomes a contest of, of viewpoints. Other people. Um, speak out because they simply honestly believe in what they believe in. Does the spiral of silence work or work as well online? The Pew Foundation, which is a reputable uh, survey firm, uh, they wanted to know, did the spiral of silence seem to hold in online discussion about uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, remember, he was the, uh, the fellow who leaked uh, NSA documents. And therefore, Mr. Snowden was a, a, a very controversial fellow. And what the Pew Foundation uh, concluded was that the spiral of silence is, if anything, a little stronger online than it is in person. That perhaps because people were afraid of the, you know, oftentimes a very harsh piling on that can occur in online discussions, that uh, folks were, were quite reticent, uh, uh, quite uh, guarded in their, in their opinions. Cultivation analysis. Cultivation analysis is a theory that is associated with George Gerbner, uh, the, the grand old man of media research, who taught for many years at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. And the theory behind cultivation analysis is, as is, uh, Dr. Gerbner used to put it, uh, the, the longer and more more steadily. You watch television, the less television appears as a screen and the more it appears to be a window on the world. In other words, what he was literally saying is if you are a longtime heavy television watcher, you are more and more likely to believe the world is the way that it is on television. Well, let's think about how does the actual world as we know it uh, differ from the way it's portrayed on TV? Well, think about drama. You know, drama uh, often revolves around, around violence. Think about news. 
you know, if, if you're going to have uh, news, uh, uh, you know, local TV news, and you have two stories to report, uh, police wrote 120 parking tickets today, or, you know, somebody got murdered, well, they're going to cover the murder, right? Uh, so one of the outcomes of cultivation analysis, uh, according to Dr. Gerbner, is what he called the mean world syndrome. You know, the, the concentration, the frequency of crime on television is far more frequent than it is in real life. It has consequences for how we perceive the world around us. For example, heavy television watchers are more likely than light or non-watchers to believe the following. They are more likely to estimate their chance of being the victim of violent crime. I mean, it, it's never zero, but heavy television watchers think that it is much more likely than statistically it really is. Uh, heavy television watchers are more likely to believe their own neighborhood is unsafe. Now, what I find interesting about that is that the view of the world they get through television becomes at some point more powerful than the view out their front door. Uh, heavy television watchers are more likely than light or non-watchers to believe that their, uh, that, that their own fear of crime is a serious personal problem. And finally, uh, those who are caught up in the mean world syndrome, those heavy long-time television watchers, are more likely to believe that the crime rate is rising no matter what the actual statistics are. Media and political bias. Well, it, there, there's probably no, um, no secret that at least part of America uh, believes that uh, that mainstream media is is in the business of telling untruths. Well, I think a case can be made that at least on uh, cable television, that there are news outlets that come from a specific point of view. Now, I've got to say, I don't get too worked up about that. I mean, if you go back in American history. Um, you know, especially 19th century and before, you had newspapers and other media that argued from a specific point of view. I mean, that's just not inconsistent with, uh, with a democracy. Furthermore, if you look to Europe, you know, some of the most well-functioning democracies in the world, you know, in places like France or Italy or Spain or, or Great Britain. You know, you have newspapers that take a very influential newspapers that uh, take an explicit point of view. Now, when we think about media and bias, uh, realize that the viewer is an imperfect judge of bias because you me and everyone else, we all have our own point of view. And so if a particular media outlet doesn't conform to our own personal world view, you may perceive it as biased. So, you know, think about that dimension as well. Now, let's talk about, uh, is there a, a systematic liberal or conservative bias in the American media? And the truth is, you can make a decent case on both sides. So, let's start by looking at it from the conservative point of view. Uh, conservatives do have a point. Uh, there, there have been uh, some uh, surveys of working news journalists and you know, what they believe. And on average, uh, uh, news reporters 
hold positions, particularly on social issues. You know, social issues would be things like uh, uh, abortion or same-sex marriage, uh, prayer in schools, and that sort of thing. Uh, Yes, reporters do hold views on average uh, a little bit uh, more liberal than the average American. Now that said, if you control for education, and reporters uh, uh, on average have a little higher than average level of education or more college than typical of the average American, you know, once you control for education, you know, you lose some of that. But still, Conservatives, okay, they got a point. Now that said, liberals have a point too. Uh, and their point is who owns the really big influential American media? You know, the, the, the giant newspapers and the television networks and so on and so forth. And that is large corporations. And, you know, who runs those large corporations? And the answer is uh, typically, uh, you know, business school graduates, uh, large investors, uh, you know, people who are not known for being a group of raging socialists. And so the liberal point of view is probably more than anything, mainstream media is in the business of protecting the status quo, you know, the way things are. Well, that brings us to the end of this chapter.